Persiens et ménagers y coururent, passions qui nous réunissaient, tant dans l'effort que dans l'épanouissement de notre couple. Elle était ma première supportrice, mon oxygène, la force qui nous poussait à me, à me surpasser lors de mes challenges physiques. Nous savions puiser dans nos regards, nos échanges, l'énergie nécessaire pour aller plus loin ensemble. This is Crime Dog. Roll the intro. Whatever you do, don't even think about subscribing to our channel. Every time someone subscribes, a hair falls out of my head. And if you keep subscribing, I'll soon look like this. And nobody wants that, do they? This week's story takes us to a young couple who live in a small village in the northeast of France. Alexia Daval is 29 years old and she works in a bank. She is married to Jonathan Daval, who is 33 years old and works in computers. They have been together for over 10 years now and they met through mutual friends. As the story goes, she chat him up. Jonathan is quite a shy fella and so she made the first move and they've been together ever since. Alexia's family live in the same village. Her parents, Isabelle and uh, Jean-Pierre, they own a local cafe. So they're pretty well known around town and they consider Jonathan like their own son. On October the 27th, 2017, Alexia and Jonathan spend the evening with her family, enjoying a soirée raclette. If you don't know what that is, you take some cheese, you melt it and you eat it until you feel sick. Also present is Alexia's sister Stephanie and her partner Gregory. Good times are had, cheese is consumed in vast quantities and then Jonathan and Alexia go home at around 11.30 p.m. According to Jonathan, the next morning he gets up around 7 and at 9 a.m. Alexia goes out for a run. At 9.15, Alexia sends a text to her sister confirming that she's gone out for a jog and that she would try and meet up with her later. She had planned with her sister to meet up with her mum to go and do some shopping together. At 10 past 10 in the morning, Jonathan goes by the family's cafe and mentions to Jean-Pierre that he's slightly concerned. He can't get hold of Alexia. Jean-Pierre tells him not to worry, she probably just bumped into a friend and got held up somewhere. Later on that morning, still no sign of Alexia, so Jonathan goes to see his brother-in-law, Gregory, and at this point he is super agitated and almost hysterical. He explains to Gregory, almost crying now, that she went out for a run this morning and she hasn't come back. Gregory says, okay, just calm down a bit. We're gonna try and retrace her steps and see if we can find her. So at approximately 11.35, they get in Gregory's car and they cruise around town looking out for Alexia. They stop off at Jonathan's house just to check that she hadn't come back while they were out there looking for her. According to Gregory, Jonathan would then enter the house screaming Alexia's name, but there's no reply. They decide to go by the local hospital, see if she was there, maybe involved in an accident, but she's not there either. So at 12.30, they go by the police station to report her missing. The local police take this pretty seriously. It's not the first time a woman has gone missing while out jogging and then turned up dead a few days later. By two in the afternoon, there are helicopters in the air, divers in the water, and sniffer dogs on the ground. As everyone knows, in cases of disappearances, the first few hours are crucial if you're gonna have a good chance of finding the person. Police officers are joined by friends, family, and about 300 people from the village in the search. Two days after she went missing, the body of Alexia is found in the woods. She has been beaten and her body has been partially burnt. The autopsy reveals she was struck in the head several times and then strangled to death with bare hands. She was burnt on her face and genital area. However, there are no signs of sexual assault. They also find a variety of medicines in Alexia's blood. The discovery sparks national outcry and genuine fear and panic in the local area. 
especially amongst walkers and runners, extremely popular activities in the area where Alexia was found. Many locals know Alexia's family through the cafe and they come together to support the parents and Jonathan. A silent march takes place on November the 5th attended by approximately 8,000 people. As this walk comes to an end, Alexia's parents give a speech. A devastated Jonathan then steps forward, supported on either side by Isabel and Jean-Pierre. Patient, aménager et courir. Patient qui nous réunissait, tant dans l'effort que dans l'épanouissement de notre couple. Elle était ma première supportrice, mon oxygène, la force qui nous poussait à me, à me surpasser lors de mes challenges physique. Nous savions puiser dans nos regards, nos échanges, l'énergie nécessaire pour aller plus loin ensemble. I'm not sure what to make of what Jonathan said there. It's not necessarily what you would expect a grieving husband to say, but let's not jump to any conclusions now. Officers immediately suspect Jonathan. Often in these cases, the husband is prime suspect, and here is no different. No one except Jonathan saw Alexia go out for a run, and on top of that, a witness gives them some crucial information. The night before her disappearance, a neighbor recalls hearing a car leaving the Duval residence at 1.26 a.m. The neighbor knows this because there is a manhole cover just opposite the Duval's garage, and it makes a noise when a car drives over it, loud enough to wake the neighbor up and take note of the time. This contradicts Jonathan, who said they were fast asleep by midnight. What Jonathan doesn't know is his car is equipped with a GPS tracker, and when they analyze it, it is confirmed that the car was used that night. Tire marks found close to the murder scene are also a match for his car. Jonathan is lying. Having gathered some pretty solid evidence, after three months of investigation, he is arrested. Alexia's parents are livid. In their eyes, there's no chance that Jonathan had anything to do with this. Under interrogation, detectives don't waste any time explaining to Jonathan what they have on him. They know he used his car and it was tracked to within 15 meters of where the body was found. Alexia's body was also wrapped in a sheet which came from their home. He denies everything, but they can sense weakness, so they pile on the pressure. After 30 hours, a breakthrough. He cracks and confesses to accidentally strangling her. Her parents are in absolute shock. They had been looking after their daughter's killer for the last three months helping him through the grieving process, unaware he was the one that killed her. Jonathan's lawyer is quick to excuse his client's actions. He claims Jonathan didn't mean to kill her. According to his lawyer, she could be overwhelming and difficult to deal with. She would also belittle him constantly. This created a lot of tension within the couple and that night she pushed him too far. He retaliated and while trying to regain control of the situation, he accidentally strangled her to death. Jonathan had a difficult upbringing. His parents divorced when he was just two years old and he suffered numerous health issues while he was growing up. His father also passed away when he was 12. Two psychiatric analysis would take place during this time, the first in the summer of 2018. The expert stated that Duval possesses an angry, aggressive, chameleon-like personality able to transform his own reality to fit with his needs, stemming potentially from a complex around his height. A year later, an uh, expert would also reveal that Duval has an obsessive personality, which makes him unstable and likely to crack at any moment. All these issues are rooted in his childhood, where he developed obsessive compulsive disorder. According to friends and family, Alexia and Jonathan were trying to have a baby, but they were struggling to conceive. Jonathan never seemed that interested in a child. He never accompanied Alexia to any of the medical appointments. He always found an excuse that he was too busy. This became a real point of contention within the couple. Jonathan claims she would lose it and hit him, and then she would pass out and the next day not remember anything that happened. Police also find text messages in which Alexia would humiliate Jonathan, 
blaming him for the fertility issues, suggesting he was incapable of giving her a child. On the 17th of June 2019, a reenactment takes place to try and clear up any lingering questions. Confronted by his contradictions, he admits to partially setting fire to Alexia's body before kicking her violently five to ten times in the head, then strangling her for four minutes. Then on the 27th of June, just as detectives are looking to wrap up this case, everything turns on its head. Duval, in front of the judge, out of nowhere, retracts his confession. He admits being in the house at the time, but denies killing his wife. He claims that his brother-in-law, Gregory, strangled Alexia in an attempt to calm her down during one of her fits of rage at the parents' house on the night of the 27th of October. He then doubles down, claiming the whole family hatched a plot to cover up the murder. Two days later, he's back in front of the judge, and this time he's joined by Alexia's family for over four hours. He maintains his new version of events, continuing to accuse his brother-in-law and suggesting his sister-in-law dictated to him everything that he was to say happened on that day. The family are completely astounded and demand another face-to-face -face with Jonathan. This time they pass in front of him one by one and Jonathan holds firm. Gregory killed Alexia. Then it's the turn of Alexia's mum, Isabel. She calmly enters the room, stands in front of Jonathan and says hello. She looks him in the eyes, takes out a photo of Alexia and their cat and asks him for the truth. Her more gentle approach works. He breaks down at her feet and confesses once again to everything that happened. On the 11th of December 2019, Alexia's family requests an uh, additional inquiry into her poisoning prior to her death. Remember I mentioned earlier that several drugs were found in her system. Zolpidem, a hypnotic with the effects of a sleeping pill. Tetrazepam, a muscle relaxer that has been illegal since 2013. And Tramadol, which is an opioid. According to the analysis, she had been digesting these drugs on a regular basis for over a year before her death, with a significant spike in her last few months. It's very unlikely she would have been taking these drugs if she was trying to have a baby. The family believes she was the victim of a chemical submission administered by Jonathan, secretly slipping her the drugs as a way to control her and avoid having a baby. The trial begins on the 16th of November 2020 and the family still has lots of unanswered questions. Right from the get-go, he admits to being the only person involved in Alexia's death. He apologizes profusely to the family and he knows that what he has done is inexcusable. However, he never really explains why he did what he did. According to Jonathan that night, she made a sexual advance towards him and when he turned her down, she got angry. An argument ensued and then degenerated into Jonathan strangling her in an attempt to shut her up. It took him a total of four minutes to strangle her to death. That's a hell of a long time to accidentally strangle someone. You would think that after a few seconds you would realize, wow, I'm actually hurting this person, I better stop. It's an odd trial, he doesn't really get things off his chest. It's over now, he's been caught, so why hold back? It's as if maybe he's protecting someone, or maybe he had some kind of accomplice. And why did he burn her face and genitals? Could this be related to the fact that they were trying to conceive? and all the problems that stem from that. The judge doesn't believe for a second that this was an accident and he condemns him to 25 years in prison for the murder of Alexia Duval. Now what I'm going to say now is completely unfounded but has gained a lot of traction on social media since the trial ended. And to be honest, when I first researched the case, this was one of the first things that came to my mind. A lot of people have suggested that maybe Jonathan is gay and even that he was perhaps in a relationship with the person he's trying to protect maybe. It explains a lot, his unwillingness to start a family with Alexia and his shortcomings in the bedroom. Was it Jonathan who was drugging her so he didn't have to have sex with her. It's possible that Alexia confronted him about this and when faced with the truth, lashed out and then there was no coming back for him. Too many media outlets, feminist groups and Alexia's parents. Her death has become a symbol of femicide. 
the press was quick to portray Alexia as the missing jogger who shouldn't have been out on her own without pepper spray. The danger with this narrative is that you won't see the male violence, you'll just presume that Alexia put herself in danger. The defence lawyers attempted to portray her as a madwoman who provoked Jonathan into committing this crime. They almost attempt to legitimise femicide and ignore the fact that every three days a woman is killed by her male partner. This wasn't a argument gone wrong or a crime of passion, it was a cold-blooded murder. To minimise domestic violence and try to find excuses is unacceptable. Nothing justifies hitting one's wife or female partner. It is reassuring how these kind of incidents are being dealt with now. Previous femicide cases used to hold an average sentence of seven to eight years. In this case, the judge wanted to make clear that it goes beyond a simple murder. This destroys an entire family. Let me know in the comments below what you think about this case. Were there more people involved? Did Jonathan deserve to go to prison for 25 years? If you enjoyed this video, please do subscribe to our channel. We love making these videos for you. And so not to miss out, also hit the notification bell. Every time we release a new video, you will be the first to know. That is all for this week. It's been an absolute pleasure. Please stay safe, look after yourselves, and see you next time.